like to welcome our chair of the World Affairs Council of Orange County, Rick Putnam. Thank you, Tristan. Uh, good evening and welcome. Um, yes, I'm Rick Putnam, chair of, the, of your executive board, um, and have the pleasure of opening our session tonight with Ken Lipper, who I know you're going to enjoy. Um, but as many of you know, we have a tradition, as the other councils do across the country, of opening our sessions with uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'd like to ask you all to stand and have our uh, council intern, Tammy Nguyen, come up to lead us in the pledge. Thank you, everyone. Please put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tammy. Please let me take a moment um, to welcome uh, some new members uh, tonight. And uh, when I speak, uh, when I say your name. If you're here, please uh, do stand up. Michael Collins, Lindsay Strong, Stephen Christensen, Kathleen Minallen, and Dr. Allen Minallen. Did I say that right? Minland. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Dean Edwards. State Senator Tom Umberg, Jeremy Liu, Robert and Grace Haukot, Manami Matsumoto, you, and Dr. John Colody. Thank you for joining the council. And now just a, a quick moment on um, upcoming events. Um, and I'm not gonna go over all that we have sort of on the potential docket, but um, on April 2nd, we have a um, very exciting morning visit and discussion with the current French ambassador to the U.S., Mr. Laurent Billy, who will be uh, discussing issues at the forefront um, of, of, of his job on Ukraine, the Middle East, and the Paris Olympics. This is a premium member, trustee, and founders club event at an intimate setting, a residential setting here in Orange County. So that's going to be pretty neat. Um, on May 11th, um, Orange County uh, Congresswoman Representative Young Kim, um, we will have at an evening dinner event, and she will discuss China and the, in the context of Southeast Asian and Pacific <coughs> policy issues. So in keeping with us being a nonpartisan, nonpolitical organization, she's really coming at uh, her foreign policy expertise, specifically in the, um, in the Western Pacific. Um, um, and she is a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. On May 30th, we'll have a noon webinar with Ambassador Jeff Davidow to review the Mexico elections and those implications. And lastly, on June 27th, we will welcome former LA mayor, mayoral candidate, prolific urban builder, and Orange County resident, little known secret, Rick Caruso, for a talk on his inspiration in building urban places from a global perspective. Um, a venue to be uh, figured out, I think, but that might be right down, right down on the harbor at Newport Beach, so it's going to be a neat, a neat event. Um, please sign up. It's easy to do, and these events often get sold out, so I uh, would encourage you uh, to sign up early. And finally, um, and as you know, to enable these programs and to encourage Orange County youth to become aware of and involved in world affairs, we depend on your support. Please assist that effort in any way you can. I encourage everyone to scan the little QR code. If you all know what that is, that's that funky looking <laughs> puzzle uh, printed thing on each table to support our spring giving campaign, which has kicked off today and runs March 27th to May 31st. Thank you very much for all you do. Um, so now I'd like to turn it over. Oh, what was that, Krista? The Q&A cards. cards, oh yes. We do have Q&A cards. So as you all know, we do um, encourage uh, questions to our speakers. Um, there is a uh, Q&A card at your table with a uh, pencil um, or pen. Please go ahead and uh, write out your questions, and we'll get those collected during the discussion uh, for answering by, by Ken as we go through. Um, so now I'd like to turn it over to my 
uh, friend and uh, fellow alum, um, Robert Motoshige, who is here with the Orange County Stanford Alumni Association and who has been a um, promotional partner with us for this event. Thank you. <clears throat> thanks, Rick. Thanks for the invitation. Um, and thanks also to um, what you guys do. So I just, quick, quick few words. Um, <clears throat> good evening. Um, welcome to this insightful gathering hosted by the World Affairs Council of Orange County. And tonight we are privileged to have a, an esteemed speaker, Ken Lipper, to enlighten us on the global business outlook, trends shaping the, the next era of commerce. My name is Robert Motoshige, the current president of the Orange County Stanford Association, which we call OCSA. OCSA is a vibrant member of our intellectual community. This dynamic group represents an alliance of alumni who have walked the halls of Stanford University, a place where innovation, leadership, and groundbreaking research are taking place on a daily basis. The OCSA, <clears throat> Uh, much like Stanford itself, is not really about reminiscing over past academic glories, but it's more about uh, bringing together a powerful network of thought leaders, entrepreneurs, and visionaries who are committed to making a difference in the world. So our association provides a platform for lifelong learning, professional development, and social interaction among Stanford alumni and friends. So in collaboration with organizations such as the World Affairs Council, we engage in critical dialogues on global issues, such as the ones Mr. Lipper will discuss tonight. The OCSA fosters a spirit of curiosity and dedication to education that extends far beyond our university years. As we delve into the trends that are sculpting the future of commerce, we look forward to robust discussions and engaging ideas and innovative perspectives, and are particularly excited about the intersection of global affairs and business, um, an area where many of our members um, excel and contribute profoundly. So on behalf of <coughs> OC OCSA, uh, I invite you to leverage tonight's springboard for conversation, network, networking, and inspiration. Um, let us listen keenly to Mr. Lipper's insights where they will surely change the way we think and challenge us to think critically about the path ahead. I'd like to invite now Alan Sipos from the Association for Corporate Growth, Orange County chapter. Good evening, everyone. I'm Alan Saipas. I know it's a tough name. Alan Saipas. I'm the uh, past president of the Association for Corporate Growth, and we had the pleasure of co-hosting the General Petraeus event with your World Affairs Council a couple of months ago. It was a fabulous event. I have the honor tonight of introducing our moderator and our speaker, and um, I'm going to start with our moderator, Professor John Aronson. M Professor Aronson is with the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism at USC and a professor of international relations at the University of Southern California. His research interests include international communications, international communications policy, and global governance. Dr. Aronson's research investigates how communication and network developments related to privacy, equity, standard setting, competition policy, cybersecurity, and international intellectual property shape the path of globalization. He's the co-author of Digital DNA, Disruption and the Challenges for Global Governance. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and serves as president of the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs. Dr. Aronson received his degrees from Harvard and Stanford. Please welcome Dr. Aronson. Many of you already know a little bit about Ken Lipper, but I did some research ahead of time and put a short list, a very short list together, <laughs> that I'm going to run through. No, don't worry. Don't worry, Krista. I consolidated that short list of accomplishments into the following. In my opinion, Ken Lipper is the, the Renaissance man. He is the most interesting man in the room. Before founding Lipper & Company, which was a multi-billion dollar investment management and corporate finance firm, the Honorable Ken Lipper 
was an investment banking general partner at Lehman Brothers and Sullivan Brothers. He served as deputy mayor, mayor of New York City under Mayor Ed Koch, and subsequently as commissioner and chairman of the Ethics and Governance Committee at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. He was co-publisher of Lipper Viking Penguin, which published the Penguin Lives series of 24 biographies by celebrated authors. He served on corporate and nonprofit boards of directors, including Neutrogena Corporation, CNH Industrial, the Lincoln Center for Performing Arts, Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and Sundance Institute. He was adjunct professor at Columbia University School of International Affairs. In addition to all of that, in film, Ken wrote and produced City Hall, starring Al Pacino. He produced The Winter Guest, starring Emma Thompson. With Steven Spielberg, he produced the Holocaust documentary, The Last Days, for which he received an Academy Award in 1988, 1998, excuse me. He also wrote the novel City Hall and Wall Street and was chief technical advisor to Oliver Stone on the latter film. And I believe had a brief cameo in that film as well. Indeed. <laughs> so give a warm welcome, please. I'm younger, if you want to see me. But <laughs> Please give a warm welcome to Ken Lipper and Professor John Aaron. Uh, Ken has already been well introduced, so I don't need to repeat it. So, so I'm going to take my two minutes and give a history of business, which is a history of change, in two minutes. Uh, the longest family-owned company uh, in the world right now, uh, outside of a ryokan in Japan, uh, is actually an armor turned gun maker, Beretta. Uh, before the 19th century, big companies were family owned, uh, almost entirely. Uh, the big change came uh, in the first half of the uh, 19th century, when two things happened. You had railroads and telegraph. And they couldn't, they were too big and too spread out to be run by a family, so it led to professional management. In 1870, John D. Rockefeller started Standard Oil. My guess is nobody in the room, except maybe Ken, knows where it started. It was started in Cleveland, Ohio. He was a refiner. And he used modern techniques to basically stomp on the competition. By 1880, it was the largest company in the world. Uh, change became part of the game. So that uh, I mentioned earlier, Fortune magazine has been keeping track of the largest companies for decades. Uh, in the 1910s, the two of the top 10 companies in the United States were Swift and Armour the meatpacking industries. So that what you have had is constant change uh, that has uh, changed everything very rapidly. With the internet, we have seen even more change. And the technology is changing incredibly rapidly so that companies, even well-run companies, have to innovate or die. So large companies that did a very good job are no longer here. And that is a continuing process. Now, I'm going to turn this over to Ken, because with the advent of the internet and other technologies, a lot has changed and continued to change. You shouldn't be surprised by that. The only thing that the internet really does, it means that the technology is going to change even faster going forward. Ken, I leave it to you. Thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction. <laughs> Uh, he's basically uh, captured the theme that uh, change is just continuing and even at a faster pace. Before I go further, though, I'd like to thank Alan for a terrifically kind introduction. I appreciate that. And also to wish Cherry in the back, who is here spending her birthday, to listen to us. So very happy birthday, Cherry. To you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Cherry, happy birthday to you. Woo! Excuse me. 
basically taking off from where John left the topic, uh, I think that this is going to be the biggest period of change perhaps ever, but certainly since the Industrial Revolution. And, uh, and the next hundred years are going to be some of the most eventful and unpredictable and most challenging uh, years for business and for the population and for people all over the world, not just in America. The changes are going to affect in Africa, Asia, everywhere. Let's look at a few uh, of the arenas that we're going to have the most dramatic change, uh, which will particularly be impactful on business. That type of uh, situation, as we all have heard of, is at the heart of AI. AI is, in fact, one of the most revolutionary uh, changes to the world, to the economy, as well as to many other aspects, but we'll talk, talk about the, the business and the economy. Uh, AI, as you know, is basically today a rapid pattern recognition uh, concept. What it does is take huge amounts of material and continuously keeps trying to decipher the patterns amongst the parts of the, the information. And as a consequence, uh, it can respond very quickly to uh, what you ask it. And that's why when you go into chat GPT or Gemini, uh, you get such a rapid response because it has been programmed and continues to program itself, constantly refining the information and uh, that it, it has. And so when you put in the queue, it's already thought about that is the best way of putting it. Uh, so we know that's going to have a huge impact on any type of clerical activity, data gathering activities, uh, you know, companies that are dealing with consumer preferences, what, what do people really like, uh, having departments that focus on market research, and uh, a lot of that will eventually be done by AI. And uh, so it's going to revolutionize how the data is gathered and, and manipulate that data in many different ways. Uh, even more uh, to the point, they, the AI is now being refined to recognize shapes. You know, up until now, it's information. And, uh, but the next generation of AI, which is being developed now, uh, is fundamentally being programmed to find out what is this and to recognize what that is in a random environment. The way AI is currently constructed, uh, if you use AI in a robot, for example, the robot would be able to do one task. It will hit the nail or hit the screw in something or, or whatever. But if the robot could learn shapes and be able to differentiate shapes, you can give it many more random tasks. So it will have a much more human-like discernment and therefore could do many tasks that are much more randomly in a manufacturing facility or anywhere else. Uh, it will do a lot of tasks uh, that are different. And uh, so robotics, is going to be one of the main beneficiaries of AI. And the ability to automate through robotics operations with few people. And the people who are now doing various tasks in an automobile factory or whatever, many of those tasks are going to be unnecessary. And, uh, and, so re and then the question is, who maintains the robots? Who programs the robots? Who is doing the support work for the robots? And so one of the factors we're going to see is needing a different workforce, an entirely different population, uh, and different training. And one of the problems that we lack in general 
and it's going to be particularly difficult with AI, is that we don't have enough skilled labor in the United States. Uh, we, you know, our education levels have fallen. Uh, so now I think we're number 38 in world educational uh, comparability. Uh, in reading, I think we're number 24, and in science, number 20. No, I think in science, we're 24, and reading, 25. Uh, and so, so I think that, uh, and in math, I think we're like 40-something. But the problem is that those are the very skills that the labor force will need. And a person in a dynamic technological world like that is going to have to probably have different jobs all the time as the technology evolves. And so really while we're telling people now, I mean the sort of rap you read in the newspapers, magazines, and young people talking about, you know, uh, I want to go to work, I, I want to make money, I don't want to go to college, I don't want to, I don't need all those things. Those are just the people who will be obsoleted quickly, too, uh, because they don't have that flexible education. In fact, we really have to revamp the whole system uh, to give them in-depth education early. Uh, other countries like China and others, Japan, the students go to school two months more than our students. So even the same student is going to be better at math if you expose him to more training. Uh, so we've had a luxury of, of, very, uh, of technology that people could master and organization of factories that people uh, can participate in. Uh, we have good highways, so you have over the, you have people driving trucks. But with AI, you're going to be able to, once it knows shapes, and that's where it's all going. Once it knows shapes, you're going to be able to program driverless trucks and driverless cars because it will be better than human drivers since it doesn't drink, it doesn't take drugs, it doesn't need to sleep. And so you could have a truck going from Los Angeles uh, to New York in a program lane with particular stops to get whatever fuel at that time it's using uh, and maybe get whatever maintenance that it needs. But basically the kind of jobs that we now pay well at and uh, are going to disappear to a large extent. Uh, a lot of jobs in driving in cities, uh, taxi drivers, you probably have a two-level fare. If you want to drive, you'll pay X and you'll have a, a driverless car, you'll pay X minus five. And over time, generations will adapt to that uh, when they see the safety records and stuff like that. Uh, so all of what we can now perceive as business is going to be rapidly changing. And, uh, and the same thing is happening in biotech. I mean, the two great revolutionary forces in the economy are, and the world are going to be AI and biotech. And they're not, and they're somewhat interrelated. Um, you know, what AI can do once it starts getting more uh, pattern recognition plus shapes, we'll be able to early on do surveys of your cells because now we also have imaging and the electron microscope, which can look at things happening in real time and gather information. And when that's put together with AI that can analyze that data well quicker and, and with more variables, in fact, being taken into account, uh, it will be able to say early on, this protein, which I've identified, uh, as being endemic to breast cancer, people who get breast cancer at 50 or 60, uh, you, they can, they'll be able to look at the precursor signs 
and address these things early. And we know from the latest Alzheimer's drugs that just were, one of them was just recognized, Biogen's Alzheimer's drug, is able to reduce uh, Alzheimer's impact for about 18 months in 35% of the population uh, if you get it early. So one of the great revolutions is going to be it would be early detection of diseases where the drugs can be applied with a greater impact. And that's going to require these drug companies that have 10,000 old drugs and patents that they didn't get to work, many of which, like the Alzheimer's drug, was tested on people with advanced illness that you can identify. When you could use AI to early give you early identification, we're going to have to go back and take all the drugs from Pfizer and all the drugs from Lilly and retest them once you get the AI to be able to, and imaging and things to identify the precursors. So all the activity in drug companies and anything related to medical is going to be, instead of only being biologists working and chemists working, the winners are going to have to have very fundamental computer expertise. Know how to operate supercomputers. Know how to use AI, because that's the future in order to get the drugs for the early patients. And uh, so you're going to have a revolutionary impact in, in all medical, in the whole medical world, on a worldwide basis, not just in, in America. So. It's ve therefore very hard to pick winners and losers now in business uh, because you don't know that a company has great chemistry or whatever, uh, or a company that's really great at making cars, whether it can find the people and train them and maintain them and have the management with the savvy to adapt to the entirely new technologies with entirely different kind of personnel. And, and it's going to be harder to make decisions because the senior management might not know enough technically, and so they're going to have to really get up to speed in order to manage the people who are beneath them and even assign the tasks. So we're in for a really revolutionary period in almost all industries. And, uh, and therefore, it's very hard when you look at the stock market, which is predicting 10 years out now with a 20 times, 21 times multiple compared to historic multiples of 15 times, it's basically saying we could predict the winners. And what I'm saying, this is exactly the opposite of what's coming. And it's going to be very, a lot of the people that things that people perceive as winners are going to be losers and just because of the inability to adapt. You know, just like the greatest buggy company didn't necessarily become the best auto company. Uh, and, and so you're going to have a lot of shifting in that area and there's a lot of risk to dominance in any industry now because a lot of small companies are going to emerge with special technologies and new ways of doing things. And now, right now, like Google is going out and buying a lot of these small companies. And now the antitrust is coming in and saying, you can't buy up all these companies. And they're suing all these big companies to say you can't buy your technology that way. Uh, so those are other patterns. You're going to get much more government involvement in, in, uh, in this arena. And, uh, and another arena, which is, again, also related to all of this in terms of, of being able to forecast. And, you know, we talked about the possibilities of AI and the possibilities of biotech all going to increase human condition in many ways. In addition to the risk of people misusing AI, it's a different discussion. But, but the possibilities for evolution are enormous with these new technologies. 
on the other side of it, uh, the opposite of man having controlled his environment for the last 50,000 years and basically conquered it, uh, you know, they weren't the fastest runners, they weren't the strongest on the planet, uh, you know, they, they, they didn't have the assets that the environment, that other animals and other creatures had, but the, what they were able to do was to think and plan and form communities and collaborate, which unlike other animals, in a very complicated way and evolve as a result. Uh, it's going to take all of those skills and enormous collaboration uh, to do it and, and to have people kind of agree on changing the education patterns, you know, and lengthening school years and emphasizing much more rigorous mathematics training and things of that type and having people be fit to have three different jobs in a lifetime and be able to get retrained is to take a lot, it's the opposite of what people talk about now is, oh, you should go to a trade school, you can make more money learning how to do a trade. Why get out of high school and go to work? It's the opposite of what's going to be their future if they're young now. And, uh, and exactly the opposite advice that you want to give to young people. Uh, and the biggest risk factor and also will even have perhaps a bigger impact on business is the climate. Uh, it's indisputable that the planet's heating. It's living in California, we know from the rains and, and uh, from the fires and uh, flooding and things of that type that we could see climate change. They could measure climate change. And you know, the, the World Climate Conference agreed that we would limit by 2050 uh, the increase in temperature versus pre-industrial period, say in 1850, uh, by 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is 2.7 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. But the reality is, right now, this last 12 months, we were at 1.45 Celsius, right, right in the world today. So we are, and in the last month, this past month, we're at 1.5. So we're at a point where you really can't predict outcome because the world's never experienced this before, but we know for every 1.5 degrees Celsius that you rise, that you lose 7% of your water. The water evaporates. And you see it in the drying of just out here. You see it in the drying of the forest and the forest fires. You see it in the torrential rains that we never had before. Uh, this, this is a relatively mild version. If you're living in Biafra, or in Kenya, you're seeing desertification of your fields. So when I was in Kenya a while ago, the rivers were running uh, with topsoil. And the desert keeps moving uh, south. And, and, uh, and more and more of the country is unable to produce food. And that's happening throughout the world and, and the inability to sustain populations is going to be enormous throughout the world. And the uh, places that you can live are going to change. And it's totally unpredictable right now what is going to happen, except it's not good. And countries like America and uh, Argentina, uh, Australia, Canada will be less impacted than a lot of the Asian countries and, and the African countries. Uh, and you're going to see a shift in the most important commodity that you can produce is going to be food. 
those countries are going to turn more and more to agriculture. And because prices throughout the world are going to go up, populations are going to be moving because of starvation. You know, you're going to have huge refugee problems all over developed countries. Uh, and, and, you're go and the food producers are going to be five or six or seven countries that have unique, uh, unique qualifications for it. And the kinds of foods that companies will manufacture or the cattle industry will be under tremendous pressure uh, because it's such an inefficient way to feed people. It so desecrates the land. And the cows produce, are the biggest producer of methane in, in the world. So there's going to be a lot of mandates about cattle. And, uh, and it's going to be really a major problem throughout the world because as people got richer, they started eating more meat. They associate being rich with eating meat. So it's kind of going counter to the sociological trend, but it's going to be very necessary. And there'll be all kinds of regulation on businesses. So for example, now, used to be you could get permanent water rights in Chile. And there was a major national strike of the population for water. Of course, there's shortages of water for drinking and home use and stuff. And so they changed the laws now that you can only have 30-year rights. And mining, like copper mining, which is a very water-intensive business. In Chile, now, uh, these companies have to build desalination plants. They can't use drinking water. So there's going to be a huge culling of industries. Water-intensive industries are going to be under enormous legislative pressure. And, uh, and uh, it's going to be very hard to, uh, to pick, again, winners and losers. I mean, we need copper, but it's going to clearly get more and more expensive. And fewer countries are going to be able to deal with it. Uh, and so getting control of the climate is going to be a huge part of business. First of all, governments are going to have to stop mandating. So we look at the airline industry. In Europe, they just passed laws a few years ago saying you have to use what they call SAF, uh, and that's aviation fuel, which is sustainable. It's double the price of regular jet fuel, and the airlines obviously don't like a volunteer for that. And so they pass mandates in Europe that every airline has to start now with 10% and in 2030 go up to uh, 30% and by 2050 to 50%. And so you see the European airlines are increasing the percentage of SAF in there. In their, in their, uh, and so a whole new industry is having to develop uh, to supply that. And you need capital, it's very expensive, uh, to build these things. And you need take, and, take or pay contracts from the airlines saying, I'm going to buy that. And that's how the Europeans came to mandates. In America, United Airlines is talking a big game. We want to be clean. We're going to, we're going to be more sustainable and this and that, but they rejected a take or pay contract with a small company called World Fuels that was going to build a plant to supply them with SAF. Shell came in and gave the money to the plant in return for an equity interest in it. But eventually, what the government will realize is that without mandates, you can't predict how much you're going to need, and therefore these companies won't build new, new supplies. And the only way the price is going to come down is if it's a much bigger supply. And, you know, so it can come down in half and be like competitive with jet fuel if everybody used it. 
but the airlines are demanding that they get subsidies from the government for it, because they're used to that. And, uh, and that's going to be a huge fight in business. So, you know, I'm not sure about the economics of these airlines in the future. At least you have to take that into consideration in knowing, you know, whether it's valued at X or Y. Uh, so those are some massive changes. There are new companies coming up, for example, that are pulling carbon out of the air. There's been a small company in Iceland, I believe it is. They have six plants that are able to pull carbon straight from the air, solidify it, and then bury it in rock formations. Now, you need special places to bury it because you have an earthquake, then you're going to pollute the... You know, you can't put it in unstable environments. And uh, they're now going to come to the United States and they're going to try to build it to scale. These are very small uh, enterprises. And the last uh, thing, that I, and then we, I want to open up for questions and stuff. The last thing is uh, the oil companies understand they want to continue to produce oil. Uh, and so they have gone into carbon recapture. And so what they're doing is capturing the carbon that they're producing. And Occidental just announced a massive program to uh, capture the carbon uh, that they're producing and then reuse it. So that they'll be themselves net, so they'll use it to produce more oil. And but it, it's continuing to produce fossil fuel. So the real key is there are several big challenges in this arena, like enormous challenges. One is you don't have transmission capabilities for very long distance transmission. Ironically, you would have all the windmills in the ocean and then have long lines that go thousands of miles, to, but electricity amps down with distance. So you need technology to lift it up and you need to have all new transmission facilities. And local towns and all of you, I'm sure, have had a fight with local people who wanted to dig up something in front of your house or put poles up. Every town has a lot of rules about what you can you have to bury in one place, you have to put it this way and that way, can't be on this area and that area. And so it takes a very long time to build transmission in this country because it's so decentralized. The decision-making process is very decentralized. So even if the utilities could be persuaded uh, to do that, uh, and we provide the infrastructure money to do that, uh, the current system of regulation doesn't permit what we need to be done. So that has to be reconsidered. And, and there's no like powerful force pushing the government to do it. And so now that the economy is expanding with AI, you're getting much more centralized data centers. So data centers are becoming ever-growing, they're doubling in the next decade, and they're huge, and they all go to certain areas. So they're like, they go to Virginia, they go to Georgia, they go to Tennessee, where they can do business. And that puts enormous stress on those utilities. And they don't have the familiarity, maybe with solar on that scale, they don't have the time to even get the infrastructure approved. And so they, they are building more plants with coal-fired and which they have locally and it's cheap. And, and they, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and these plants cost billions of dollars to build. So if you build a coal-fired plant or a fossil fuel plant, they're going to be around for 50 years. So while we're trying to amp down use of, of fossil fuels in cars, say, the electricity that they need to charge them 
is putting pressure on the system and you, the only way they can do it is through fossil fuels. So it's one of the huge dilemmas for business and government is how to coordinate all this. Ken? Uh, to leave some time for questions, could you make your could you make your third point quickly? So and then we can go to some questions. Oh, the, just the last point I was uh, making, and I'm sure there'll be questions. Uh, another type enormous uh, challenge is the decoupling of of China from the West, and having the world be divided into two huge blocks. And so all trade is going to be disrupted more and more. Uh, there's going to be rebuilding of supply chain. So companies coming here, so all the semiconductors, for example, are coming here now. You know, there's like a trillion dollars of semiconductor construction going on in America. Uh, as Samsung is building a huge facility, Taiwan Semiconductor is building a $135 billion facility. Uh, so the problem is we don't have the skilled workforce. So Taiwan is bringing people from Taiwan to help run those facilities. So again, you really need really skilled uh, skilled people, trained people, and we're going to feel that shortage. And, you know, I think in a peculiar way, like if you look at the Australian system or Canada's system or other countries' systems, they give special priority to immigrants who have skills of that type. They identify, we need so many engineers, we need so many of this, and anyone who has those kind of credentials could come in. We might have to reconsider that whole notion of who we let in and and uh, what, how to regulate that, and that's obviously going to be have to be considered when they look at the immigration overhaul. Uh, it's the future. Anyway, I'll leave it there, and we'll answer questions. Uh, and I have questions. <coughs> Shoot. So uh, let me ask questions from the audience in. Uh, uh, the different areas that you talked yeah. about. First, uh, AI. The question is, how would you compare the mainstream adoption of AI by business uh, and individuals in, uh, <laughs> impact to the adoption of the internet? So, how is the uh, is it an extension or is it a uh, entirely different? Well, it's it's another gigantic wave uh, of that proportion, such as the internet, but it has the potential to be even more transformative because the internet helps you with tasks and the dispersion of information and knowledge and things like that. This is going to go further and allow you to investigate things that you, the human mind couldn't initiate. It's going to see things in your body that we otherwise couldn't know. And uh, so it's not just speeding up knowledge, it's literally exposing knowledge that we don't have the ability as humans to gather on our own. Uh, so I think it's going to be an even more revolutionary force and it's going to be intruding into our daily lives. You know, you'll have robots around, you'll have uh, job shifts of enormous numbers, uh, you'll have uh, self-driven cars, and every, everything is going to be altered by this. And again, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, or maybe even in, by, you know, but in 25 years everything's going to be rapidly. So you'll see companies that you know, lose half their value because they couldn't adapt to that. And companies that we never heard of popping up. Second question, um, an interesting one. Joe Biden famously has been extremely supportive of labor unions. Uh, some of the uh, activities with AI and global globalization 
I always thought I was too loud. Oh, well, uh, some of the ideas, uh, what do you, the, the question is simply, what role do you see for labor unions and their importance going forward? Well, I mean, you're going to have, you know, an obvious mandate of, of uh, the labor unions are to try to maintain the current workforce as much as possible. And you saw that with the automotive strike that we just had. Uh, you saw it in Hollywood uh, with the writer's strike. And, and uh, so there's going to be a lot of conflict, legitimate conflict, between people trying to maintain their ability to make a living and companies being able to do things at 10% of the cost. Uh, and uh, so th I think that the labor unions are going to have to gradually adjust to the reality. Uh, uh, otherwise, you'll have all other countries that do adjust uh, will, will have an advantage. Uh, they'll have to retrain. It will be a good group where you could retrain people because it's organized already. So if you had a labor union, they do have training programs now. If they can get people to retrain the workforce to help operate this, uh, that would be very important. Uh, some of those companies will be much more profitable because they'll need less, less labor. Uh, so it's a very dynamic situation. The unions, uh, will rightfully try to protect what they have. Uh, the, but I think within that context, they have to be dynamic and retrain their people to benefit to what's coming and, uh, and work with the companies on that uh, to make it happen. We have time for a couple more, please. One, one person asks uh, that, did he understand you correctly that a high PE ratio normally implies more confidence in our uh, predictions of winners and losers, uh, or the, does the PEA ratio can be viewed as a measure of confidence? Uh, I gather that you would disagree with uh, the uh, current uh, PE ratio uh, and that something may be out of kilter. I do disagree with the current PE ratio. Uh, for those who are not immersed in the silliness of Wall Street, uh, but uh, the PE is price to earnings. And the earnings is not necessary. The valuation of the stocks is not necessarily on the earnings today, but on the earnings five years, used to be five years out. Now they're looking 10 years out. And, and, uh, and as a result of this, they're basically saying, I could predict that XYZ company is going to be a winner. That they are going to dominate AI or they dominate this field or that field. And from that, they could project out the earnings and say, in 10 years from now, that company is going to be earning 50 times more than now. And therefore, the price of it should be 50 times more than now. And they're discounting it, taking into effect time. So 50 times more the price, uh, but with a discount factor because you have to wait 10 years for it to happen and that. The, that's kind of making a, a, a judgment that things are going to go as you predict, that this company is going to win and, and you could say, and there are different times when that was much easier to predict and, and uh, because th there wasn't dramatic change going on. There was always change, don't get me wrong, but it was more understandable, more apparent. And now what the market multiples are saying is we know it's all going to work out. <laughs> and furthermore, we know this company is going to do it and that company is going to do it. And what I'm saying is, when you have these macro factors, 
these enormous changes going on, we know a lot less of which companies could do it. Because we don't know what factors are going to go into and how they're going to adjust. As I said earlier, you don't know whether the company that makes the best machine tools right now has the best workforce of machine tools, has the best equipment, has, gets the highest prices with the biggest profit margins, because they're reliable, whether that company is going to be able to adapt to robots making these things and have the management skills to be able to do such a transition. So all I'm saying is things are much more up for grabs now in terms of predictability than the prices would reflect. I have three more questions from the audience. Let me put two of them together, even though they're quite different. Um, the first one is migration. Clearly, with climate change, with uh, difficulties around the world, there are many people on the move, and they are on the move for completely understandable logical Correct. reasons. At the same time, you noted that Canada, Australia, and others are trying to fine tune the uh, migrants that they take into their countries. Should the United States be doing the same thing? Can the United States and really Western Europe as well do this same thing? From a practical point of view, it's going to be necessary to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, from a political point of view, it raises values issues. You know, what, what you think as a person, what you think the obligations of a country are to take so many people in or unlimited people in. Uh, but, you know, we have to ask two big questions. Will there ultimately be jobs for people like that? For example, I mean, right now, you know, people argue that there are jobs and they can do this. And, uh, but in fact, we might need computer engineers and we might want to reach out to India uh, to get those people where they're trained technically very well. And many of the, they have, you know, where we, I don't know what the ratio is, but they produce like 50,000 engineers a year, 100,000 engineers, same in China. So, uh, you know, so we might have to rethink, you know, that we need biologists. We can't, you know, all these laboratories, you go up to Harvard University's in the science area where I was visited recently. Uh, you have every, every... Have chosen a different example for university? <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> I am sure that it's Stanford as well, that if you go into a laboratory, if you go into a laboratory, and I'm happy to come visit Dory, they invited me to go to Harvard. Uh, the, uh, uh, if you go into the laboratories, you'll see literally a United Nations of people working there. Every race, every ethnic group, and the only thing they have in common is they all speak English. Um, but everyone is, is from somewhere. Yep. Two more questions. The first, uh, you mentioned at the end uh, the tensions between the US and China. There's much talk about decoupling or the, this century being the Asia century. Uh, if the last century was the American century. The question is this. If the, uh, a, an invasion occurred, if the conflict heated up between China and Taiwan, whether or not the United States went in, how long would it take to replace uh, the highly sophisticated uh, chip manufacturing capabilities uh, in Taiwan, where TS, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, after all, uh, produces in one square mile, 20% of the high-grade chips in the world? It's a huge problem. Uh, I mean, first of all, a lot of people are assuming China has an advantage of invading Taiwan. Uh, I mean, it, they have a political rap because of their ideology, but not, I don't know what risks they're willing to take. 
uh, to do it. So I, I'm not I, I'm not in the camp that it's imminent. Uh, I, I just don't think so. But uh, it would be extraordinarily disruptive to the world, and uh, and frankly, it would affect China as well, because China's exports are going to Europe and are going to the United States. So if those economies in any way came to a halt, uh, China would shut down too. So there is sort of a little bit of a mutual destruction understanding in, in that concept. Now, President Biden, to his credit, understands the long-term risk of dislocation, let's say, and having your being so dependent on your industrial oxygen on a, a small island producer with hostile neighbors. Uh, so that's why a trillion dollars are being invested in the United States now uh, to produce these sophisticated chips. So Samsung, Taiwan Semiconductor, all of those people are moving the facilities here, and in effect, that gives us security of supply. Uh, I mean, that's the concept, is that on something so vital, there should be a security of supply. Uh, now, whether we can become self-sufficient is such a dynamic field. It's changing so fast, and China itself is getting more and more dynamic and expert in this. Uh, so it's hard to predict, but there's no way the world could do without Taiwan right now. It would take many, many years, 10 years, 15 years, to even try to reproduce what they have. Uh, so that's why I don't, I mean, I don't think China is self-destructive or irrational. I think they're actually the opposite. They're very rational. So I don't think they want to shut down the place. Uh, last question. You have given a, a wonderful, uh, insightful presentation about three major factors affecting business and the world economy, namely AI, climate issues, and uh, the decoupling or U.S. and China mm -hmm. tension. On a personal basis, uh, one of our uh, listeners has asked, and I quote exactly, you've had a magnificent career in many different sectors. What was your inspiration for going into filmmaking and writing? <laughs> it was something I hadn't tried. <laughs> no, the real way it happened was quite by accident. Writing, writing I did intend to do. And, and uh, I had written articles, and I, I always liked to write. Uh, but I never dreamed, uh, well, I, I dreamed, but I never expected uh, to write, but uh, novels and stuff, but, but uh, more likely publishing novels was my thinking. Uh, but what happened was Oliver Stone, out of the blue, the only knowledge I had of Oliver Stone was having seen Platoon, uh, came to me in the beginning of 86, uh, and uh, he wanted to do a film about Wall Street. And he had a story he wanted to tell, but he didn't know the setting. You know, he, could, he didn't, he had enough smarts to know that it was a very technical, specialized setting and lifestyle. And, and uh, so someone that worked for me in the government 30 years before said, oh, the guy to do that is Kenny Lipper. Uh, it shows how fate, right, uh, floats over you. He said he knows all about Wall Street and he was in the government and that's what you want to write about. So out of the blue, Oliver Stone called and said, could we meet? And uh, after a bit of a rocky start after the first meeting, the second meeting worked better. Uh, and, uh, you know, after telling me he didn't need me, <laughs> his producer called back at 11 o'clock at night and said, 
he really liked you. <laughs> so that's how I got into it. And it was Oliver who suggested uh, that I could write the novel. And that would actually help us because we were working on the script. And, and that way I could refine my ideas and we could tell the story together. So, so that's how I got into writing that kind of work. And, uh, and then it was logical that once we, he, had, he writ, wrote the script, uh, once we were going into making a movie, again, he's, he's, a, he's a really great director. And being a great director, you've got to be smart enough to know what you don't know and who you need for certain functions. And that's what a director does. So, you know, he needed someone like me. You know, what, did, what would that trading room look like? What would people be doing? What makes it, what he said on Actors Studio, they asked him, how did you make those trading rooms so realistic? And how did you do all that? And he said, oh, that was Kenny Lipper. <laughs> yeah. One of my son-in-laws called me and said, I can't believe that Oliver Stone just said on the actor studio that you, I said, oh, grow up. <laughs> let, let, uh, let me close with one little story and then thank Ken and you. The story is this. I, uh, Ken has in his house in New York a framed cartoon from The New Yorker, which is a little old for lady fortune teller being consulted by a little old lady client. Uh, and the fortune teller says to the client, why are you asking me about the future? Ask Kenny Lipper. <laughs> Tonight we have asked Kenny Lipper. I want to thank all of you for coming. And Ken, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> How many of you are going to take what you've heard tonight and go back and have other conversations with other people in your lives that you know are going to be fascinating because of this presentation tonight? Yeah. I love that. <laughs> so I love that energy because we've just kicked off our spring fundraising drive today, and we would like to do more of programs like this, but we can't do it without your help. We have a small but mighty paid staff of three. Everything else is run by volunteers and interns and fellows, and we want to do more, but we need your help to do it. So please contribute what you can and ask us if you'd like to be involved in any way, and we would love to help you. My name is Jane Herring. I'm the vice chair of the World Affairs Council of Orange County. And I have the distinct pleasure of thanking my dear friend, Ken Lipper, for being our speaker Thank tonight. Thank, thank you. And thank you, Professor Erickson, as well. My pleasure. And thank you all for being here. Please continue talking. Tell everyone you know about this event. And please come back for more. Thank you.